The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, so today uh, we're going to continue where we left off with kinetics. And so the topics we're going to cover today, we're going to talk about radioactive decay, which is an example of a first order process. Then we're going to talk about second order integrated rate laws. Then we're going to do something that I love, which is to go back and connect the first topic that, that I taught in the second half of the semester, chemical equilibrium with kinetics. So we're integrating all the material from this half of, of the course. And uh, then we're going to start talking about reaction mechanisms. And on Wednesday, we'll talk more about reaction mechanisms. Uh, and so this will you know, move you uh, closer to being able to do more of uh, the problems on problem set 10. And again, we're going to be in kinetics for the rest of the semester. So other topics we'll cover after mechanism. We'll talk about temperature, and we'll talk about catalysts as well. So most of kinetics is in chapter 13, but the little bit we're going to do on radioactive decay is in chapter 17. So just to review where we were on Friday, so we were talking about half-life for a first-order process. So first-order half-life. So half-life is just the time it takes for half of the original material to go away. And its symbol is T1 half. So last time we took the first order integrated rate law, and we were able to solve for an expression for half-life. And all we had to do is say, all right, by definition, when half of the original material has gone away, then your t is equal to t a half. It's the half-life. And then the uh, expression for the original material, so that's the concentration of A to the O, the original material, drops out. And we find that for a half-life expression, it's independent of the concentration that, that you started with. So it depends then on the rate constant k. So an example of a first order process is radioactive decay. So radioactive decay, the rate at which it happens, is independent of the number of nuclei that surround the material. So that's another way of saying it's independent of, of the concentration. So this is a first order process. And so we can use the same things we learned on Friday when we were talking about concentrations of material and apply them to radioactive decay. So because this is first order here, it's independent of the surrounding nuclei, we can apply these first order integrated rate laws that we uh, derived on Friday. So here were the ones we derived on Friday. We found that the concentration of a material A um, at some given time is equal to its original concentration times e to the minus kt, where k is the rate constant and t is the time. And uh, we just looked at this again, that the half-life for a first-order process uh, is equal to 0 0.6931 over that rate constant. Now we can take these equations and just rewrite them in terms of nuclei, because we're talking about radioactive decay. So instead of concentration, then, we're going to use this term n, which is the number of nuclei. So we can put that in instead. So now we have a new expression where n, the number of nuclei at some given time, is equal to, and, and not here, the number of original nuclei in the sample, e to the kt. And k is a rate constant, but now it's called the decay constant, because we're talking about radioactive decay. But it's the same principle. It's just a slightly different word for it. And you have time. So it's the same expression. Instead of concentration, we have number of nuclei. So chemical kinetics is talking about monitoring changes of concentration over time, whereas nuclear kinetics is talking about measuring decay events. And so here, we're gonna, we would be measuring with a Geiger counter detecting radiation. Over here, you're measuring changes of concentration of material. 
So I just brought a, a Geiger counter with me. And so if we turn this on, we can see if we have any radioactivity in the room. So the ra radiation will cause an ionization and cause a current flow, and the current flow causes clicking. So we'll see if uh, see how clean the classroom is over here. Can, can you hear it? OK, seems, seems pretty good. I'll check over there later just to be sure that we're free. So my lab uses x-rays to uh, determine structures of enzymes. So we need this to, uh, to check to make sure we have no leaks in our x-ray generator, that we're not exposing anybody who comes by the laboratory. All right, so that's how, that's how you could measure whether there was any radioactivity and how it would change. And if there's a lot of radioactivity, then you start hearing the clicks much, much faster. So we can also talk about activity of a sample. And activity is abbreviated A here. And so the activity, or the decay rate, is just the change in the number of nuclei. Remember, n is the number of nuclei over time. And so uh, activity would then be equal to the decay constant times the number of nuclei that you have. And because the activity would be proportional to the number of nuclei, you can also take the expressions that we just looked at. So we just looked at this expression, that the number of nuclei uh, that you have at some given time is equal to the number that you had originally uh, times e to the minus kt, the, rate, the decay constant times time. You can also express that in terms of activity. So here we have the activity of the sample at some given time is equal to the original activity that the sample had, e to the kt, the decay constant times time. So you could use either one of these depending on what you're given in a, particular, in a particular problem. So in terms of units then, the SI unit uh, for activity is a BQ, a Becquerel, and this is equal to one radioactive disintegration per second. And the older unit, which you've probably heard of, is called the Curie. And one Curie is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10th disintegrations per second. Does anybody know which Curie this is named after? I heard some Marie and some Pierre. There's only two really guesses here. It's actually Pierre Curie. I always assumed until I looked this up recently that it would have been Marie Curie. After all, she was the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize. I figured she could have a unit named after her. Um, but in fact, it was her husband that the unit was named after. And she was involved in naming the unit after her husband. Uh, and it's because of his, uh, it was named after him because of his untimely death in 1906, I think it was. Uh, he was killed in some kind of road accident. And some people speculate that the effects of radiation were uh, already upon him and he wasn't paying so much attention. Uh, maybe it was the absent-minded professor thing, I don't know. Anyway, he ended up um, having an unfortunate accident and having the unit named after him. So uh, he did share with his wife the Nobel Prize before he died, but his wife went on to win a second Nobel Prize after his death. So she got two Nobel Prizes and he got one and a, and a unit named after him. Um, although the, the unit is no longer used, so she probably got the better deal in terms of uh, long-term history. But um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at the time, this is the reason why it was changed is this is a pretty inconvenient unit. This is a really big number right here. And at the time they were deciding what, what uh, this unit should be, uh, it was pointed out that this was kind of an inconvenient number. This is way more radiation than a normal sort of worker with radiation would be handling. Uh, but Marie Curie put her foot down, apparently, and said that she didn't want her husband's name associated with a unit that represented an infinitesimally small quantity of material. So. Uh, as a consequence, this is a large number that was impractical and later substituted. So uh, the person that Marie and Pierre Curie shared the Nobel Prize with was Henry Becquerel. So apparently uh, his wife had no objections. And so now this 
a much smaller unit is named after him. Whenever I talk about this, I always ask, it makes me curious whether there is a unit that's named after a woman. So as you go through MIT, you might want to check with your professors where these units came from. And if you find one that's named after a woman, please let me know, because I'm not aware of any, and it's sort of a curiosity of mine if such a thing exists. All right, so the current unit uh, up here, and this is the older unit. OK, so a little bit on, uh, we're not going to do much in chapter 17, but a little bit on some of the types. And this is just a table in your book. I didn't put it in your handout, because I don't expect you to know, uh, really know, know any of this. It'll be presented in the problem if you need to know it. But just to mention types of uh, radiation, um, alpha decays and beta decays, alpha decay, the particle uh, that you're talking about is equivalent to a helium-4 nucleus. Uh, beta decay equivalent to uh, electron. So sometimes you get a change in mass. Sometimes you get a change only in uh, atomic number. And uh, the half-lives are very different. Again, you don't need to know this, but you'll need to look these up for some of the problems that you do, uh, what the half-life is. And this is right out of your book. So I think a few problems require you to go back to this table and uh, look up the half-life for a particular material in question. OK, so we're going to do, I'm going to do an example of radioactive decay. And uh, to do this, I'm going to turn to poetry for this particular example. So one of our chemistry grad students, um, Mala uh, Radhakrishnan, is also a poet. And uh, so this is one of her poems, Days of Our Half Lives. And this is published in a collection of poetry all about chemistry. Uh, she's now working on a biochemistry book, if anybody is interested. Uh, this is Chemistry for the Couch Potato. And her poem has to do with uranium-238. And this is in your handout, this particular chart. So here, alpha decays are indicated by uh, this yellow line, and the beta decay is in the blue line here. And so here's uranium-238 at the very top. And this is all the various things that can happen to uranium-238 as it goes through series of alpha and beta decays. OK, so this is days of our half-lives. My dearest love, I am writing you to tell you all that I've been through. I've changed my whole identity, but loved I can't pretend to be. When I was uranium-238, you were on my case to start losing weight. For five billion years, I'd hope and I'd pray. And finally, I had an alpha decay. Two protons, two neutrons went right out the door. And now I was thorium-234. But my nucleus was still unfit for your eyes, not positive enough for its large size. But this time, my half-life was not very long because my will to change was really quite strong. It took just a month, not even a millennium, to beta decay into protactinium. But you still rejected me right off the back. Protactinium, who's heard of that? So beta decay I did once more to become uranium-234. Myself again, but a new isotope. You still weren't satisfied, but I still had hope. Three alpha decays, it was hard, but I stayed on. Through thorium, then ra radium, then radon. I thought I would finally please you. My mass was a healthy 222. But you said, although I like your mass, I don't want to be with a noble gas. You had a point. I was not reactive. So in order to please you, I stayed proactive. And a few days later, I found you and said, two more alpha decays, and now I am lead. You shook your head. You weren't too keen on my mass number of 214. I had a bad experience with that mass before. An unstable acetine walked right out the door. So in order to change, I went away. But all I could do was just beta decay. My hopes and my dreams started to go under, because beta decays 
do not change a mass number. To business and plenium, I hoped and I beckoned. My half-life was 164 microseconds. And then I alpha decayed, and then I was led with a prize-worthy mass of 210. You've got to admit I was getting quite tired, and my patience with you had nearly expired. You were more demanding than any I had dated, and much of my energy had already been liberated. You still weren't happy, but I had a fix. I really like the number 206. So I waited for years until the day which began with another beta decay. And then one more. And finally, in the end, I alphaed to lead 206, my friend. To change any further, I wouldn't be able, no longer active, but happily stable. It took me billions of years to do, but look how I've changed, and all just for you. And what did you say? I had gotten so old that you'd rather be with a young lass of gold? Well, I give up. We're through, my pumpkin. Shouldn't all my efforts be counting for something? Well, I won't, you won't be able to rule me anymore, because I'm leaving you not for one atom, but for four. That's right. While you were away diffusing, I met some chlorines that I found quite amusing. <laughs> And we are going to form lead CL4, and you won't be hearing from me anymore. So over the years, I've grown quite wise. I've learned that love's about compromise. You still have half of your half-lives to give. So now you go out there. It's your turn to give. Okay, so there is an example of radioactive decay that brought us all the way up here to all the way down here. All right, so now let's actually look at an example of how we might work a problem. Uh, and if anyone else has uh, any poetry suggestions for other topics in freshman chemistry, feel free to submit those as well. Okay, so now let's just work an example. So we want to find the original activity, and the activity after 17 years, which is equivalent to 5.4 times 10 to the 8 seconds, of 0.5 grams of, of plutonium-239. And this is the, uh, the half-life in years and also in seconds. So we can use this equation. We want to find activity and uh, original activity, and we need to know original number of nuclei and the decay constant. But before we can use that, we have to find uh, the decay constant and the number of nuclei to be able to find the original activity. So first we can look at the number of original nuclei, and so we're given that there were 0.5 grams. We can convert that with the uh, ato atomic weight and here you want to use the atomic weight that's given in the form of that isotope. So you don't need to look this up in the periodic table. Uh, you just take that number which is given to you and plug it in down here. Then we need to convert with uh, this number, which is what? Avogadro's number. Uh, convert the number of nuclei that are in one mole. And so then we can get the number of nuclei originally in the sample, in 0.5 grams of the sample. So that's 1.3 times 10 to the 21 nuclei. Then we can find K. So how can we find K with what is given here? So what do we know that's useful? We know the half-life, right. So we can easily find K from half-life uh, by the equation for a first-order half-life process. So that's just 0.6931 over the half-life and the only thing tricky here is you want to make sure that you're going to have all your units come out OK. So either all in years or all in seconds. Uh, so if we plug in the second value here, we can get our decay constant K in seconds. 9.1 times 10 to the minus 13 seconds to the minus 1. So now we have a number of nuclei originally present and the decay constant, so we can calculate the original activity. And so we can just plug that in. And so we get, for our units, we have nuclei per second and one uh, disintegration per second. 
is a becquerel, so nuclei per second is just a becquerel, so that's in BQ. See, that is a more convenient unit than the Curie. So that's our original value. Now if we want to know, after 17 years, how much activity is left, we can use the, uh, this equation down here, that the activity at some given time is, the activity, uh, time, is equal to the activity originally times e to the minus kt, where that's the decay constant in time. So we can plug in our original activity that we just calculated, uh, put in um, our decay constant, which we calculated up here. And here we just have to make sure we have the same unit. So 17 years uh, was converted to number of seconds. And we can put that in. And uh, we can solve. And we get the same answer. So to uh, the significant figures, it's the same. So no significant difference. And this is one of the problems with radioactivities, materials that are radioactive, is that they're around for a very long time. And so one problem with radioactive material is how are you going to store it? A lot of times the materials we have to store things don't last as long as the material we're trying to store. So this is, uh, this is a problem that uh, every once in a while gets talked about in the general media uh, and political discussions. Uh, but here's an example that these things are around for quite a long time. All right, so I'll just mention a use of radioactive decay. A lot of people think of radioactive materials and get sort of frightened by them, but they actually can be very useful. And uh, they can save lives and uh, make money. So uh, here's an example from, from MIT. This is a picture of uh, Alan Davison, who's uh, just retired last year from the chemistry department. And so I, he uh, paid attention to some freshman chemistry stuff and figured out a, a good way of uh, making a material that could be used for imaging. And so uh, what he did, he has uh, this technetium, and he figured out how to put it in a coordination complex that had just kind of the right sort of properties that you want from, for imaging. It wouldn't be uh, in the system very long. It wouldn't be too harmful. But yet it would, uh, it, it would uh, give you some good, good scans. And so he paid attention to. Uh, to metals in this uh, D block area that we've been talking about. And he said, hmm, how can I put this together in a coordination complex that would have just the right properties? So, uh, so he took one of these guys, and in gray are some of the ones that have been used uh, in medicine that are not naturally occurring in the body. And so he made a coordination complex. And the ligands he chose were cyanide ligands to get the desired properties. And, uh, this uh, patent for cardiolite has made, put under uh, a lot of money. That's really putting it very mi mildly. Um, the, uh, the patents, there's money to MIT, to Alan Davison himself, other people who are involved. And the chemistry department has gotten money for this, too. And a lot of our, over the last 10 years, a lot of sort of discretionary funds and scholarships and other things we've been able to do has all been a, a result of this. Now, the patent just expired on this. So we're looking for other people who pay attention in freshman chemistry to come up with some basic principles, put it together, and uh, have a new patent that would allow us to kind of carry on. We liked having all of this uh, extra money around. Um, so you can be thinking, thinking about that. So just sort of basic principles here. And it's also saved a lot of lives. They've moved on and tried to use it now for imaging different kinds of cancers and things like that. So it's, um, it's really a, a pretty wonderful, wonderful material. All right, so radioactivity uh, can be uh, difficult to store, but it also can be very useful. So that's first order processes. Uh, radioactive decay is one of the best examples of a first order process. Now let's talk about uh, second order. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to derive, as we did for the first order rate laws, we're going to derive some second order integrated rate laws. So here's second order. We have a little equation, 2a going to b. And uh, the rate expression, disappearance of a over time. And the rate law would be equal to k the rate constant times the concentration of A, and the order of the reaction is second. It's a second order, so you know that that's a 2 there. And again, 
uh, as we talked about last time, what you see up there, you have A to the M. Uh, this is, uh, indicates the order of the reaction in, with respect to A. So this is second order. Now, as we did last time, we're going to separate the terms. We're going to take the terms that have to do with concentration and put them on one side and put everything else on the other side, including the time terms. And so uh, here, uh, here we've rearranged things. We've brought uh, A squared over to one side. We have dA over here. We've taken the negative sign and dt and put it on the other side with k. And so we have these uh, separated. And now we can integrate. So again, as we did last time, we're going to integrate from some initial concentration of A, the original concentration of A, to the concentration of A at time t. And on the other side, we're going to go from zero time to time t. And so here's our expression. And now we can take this and solve this expression. So there's just the expression again copied to the front of the page, top of the page. So we can solve this. And we get uh, in brackets 1 over the concentration of A to time t minus 1 over the initial concentration of A, the original concentration of A, all in brackets with a minus. And on the other side, we have minus kt, uh, the rate constant, and the time. So now we can rearrange this expression. So uh, now we know we want to arrange it such that the concentration of the material at time t is on one side. We have kt over here and 1 over the original concentration of A on the other side. And you'll see that this is, uh, can be written in a format for a straight line. So if we plot information about how A changes with time, and again, with chemical kinetics, it's all about how concentrations of things change with time uh, versus time, we can get out information that we want for a second order equation. So here is what a plot would look like. So you're plotting, you're collecting your data, you're collecting changes of concentration of A. So you're measuring the concentration of A at given time points. And so you'll plot that versus, uh, versus time. And you should get a straight line. If you don't, something seriously wrong uh, with uh, something that you're doing. Uh, so you should get a straight line. And so the intercept of the line would be 1 over the initial concentration, the original concentration of A. And then the slope of the line is going to give you your rate constant, which is what you usually want to know. You want to be measuring rate constants for particular reactions. So now let's talk about second order half-life. So we'll start with uh, this uh, second order integrated rate law. And now half-life, you're going to consider the time it takes for half of your original material to go away. So at this point, when you're talking about second order, your AT, your concentration of A at time T, is half the concentration of what you had originally here. So we can plug that in. So the concentration at the time t that you're interested in is now half of what you had to start with by definition of half-life. So your time now has sort of a new symbol by it. It's uh, t to the half down here. And now we can uh, rearrange this and solve for, for this. So as we rearrange it, we can move the, the 2 up there. And we can bring these concentration terms uh, to the same side of the equation. We can subtract now, which gives us 1 over the initial concentration of A. And then if we rearrange so that we solve for the half-life, move uh, the, rate, the rate constant down over here, and we can get our expression. So what's the biggest difference between this expression and the one for first order half-life? 
dependence on concentration, right? So the concentration term is in there. With first order process, the term for concentration is no longer in the expression. So the half-life does not depend on the concentration of the original material, but here the concentration term is in the expression. So second order half-life depends on the starting concentration of the material. OK. So if you were really in a lab doing experiments, you often need to figure out if something is first or second order. And uh, in the problem set, you'll have some different things where you're trying to figure out or show you how the rate changes with different concentrations. And often what, what you do in a laboratory is you plot data and see whether it does fit. I said if you didn't get a straight line when you're plotting, something is wrong. So uh, in real life, sometimes you would be plot, you'd be plotting data. You can plot data as a first order plot. So our first order expression was here. The natural log of the concentration of A at a given time is equal to minus KT plus the natural log of the initial concentration. So uh, here would be a plot of that. And then for second order, we'd use the equation that we just derived. So instead of natural log, you're plotting one over the concentration versus time. And if the data really was a second order process, you should get something that looks good over here, whereas over here you should get something that doesn't really look good. So in real life, often what you're doing is seeing how well data fits to some assumption that you have, and you're deciding the orders of reaction uh, depends, you find that out experimentally, it's usually not given to you, that's something that you would be doing, and you'd be looking at how, uh, how a, a rates change with time, and uh, you'd be plotting out data and seeing how well it fits your assumptions. OK. So now, now we get to go back and think about what does this rates have to do with chemical equilibrium? What is the connection between rates and chemical equilibrium? So at equilibrium, one way we can define equilibrium is that the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions are equal. So now we're thinking about equilibrium in terms of rates. OK, I'll leave that up, I guess. OK, so let's write out our standard uh, reaction. Hmm. Chalk is really good. No. Ah, here's a good piece of chalk. So in our standard reaction, we have A plus B going to C plus D. And that's how we've been expressing it. But now we're going to think about rates. So we're going to give the forward reaction a little K1. And the backward reaction, oh, I'm going to do K minus 1. K minus 1. So over the reverse and the backward direction. So now we can express the rate for the forward reaction, the rate for the forward reaction. And we can assume here that this is an elementary reaction. So we can write our rate law exactly the way the equation looks. So if we do that, the rate is going to have a term. It's going to have a rate constant, K1. And it will depend on the concentrations of our two reacting materials. So the concentration of A and the concentration of B. So we can write this rate law without doing any of the experimental stuff if we're told that it's an elementary reaction, a simple reaction. We can also write the rate for the reverse reaction, so the reaction going in the other direction. And so that rate will be equal to, rate law will be equal to the rate constant for the reverse direction, which is k minus 1, times the concentrations of C and D. So that's the rate in the reverse direction. So what do we know about k? What is big K? What's big K?
What is big case? Oh, you're okay, C products over reactants, C times D over all right, A, B. So that's our equilibrium constant. So at equilibrium, then, according to this, this new definition, the rates of the forward reaction will be equal to the rates of the reverse reaction. So at equilibrium, K1, the rate of the forward reaction, K1 times A times B, is going to be equal to K minus 1 times C, concentration of C, times the concentration of D. So that's what happens at equilibrium. Rates of the forward reaction equal rates of the reverse reaction. So then, if we rearrange that expression, we will see that that means that K is going to be equal to K1 over K minus 1. Because if we rearrange this, C over D, CD divided by AB is going to be equal to K1 divided by K minus 1. So these are equal. So you can express K in terms of the concentrations, and it's also going to be equal to those two rate constants. So what does this mean in terms of our big, K, big equilibrium constants and small equilibrium constants that we've been talking about? So in kinetic terms, when we talk about K being greater than 1, so before we were talking about the equilibrium being greater than 1, we're talking about more products than reactants at, at equilibrium, and we weren't really talking anything about the rates of the reaction. But what's going to be true in terms of these small Ks, K1 and K minus 1? If big K, if the equilibrium constant is greater than 1, what's true about those two? So here, K1, then, has to be greater than K minus 1, or the rate constant for the forward reaction has to be bigger. So rate constant for forward reaction is bigger. And K, big K, equilibrium constant K, less than 1 means that the rate of the reverse reaction, reverse rate constant, is bigger. So now you can think about equilibrium constants in a new way. You can think about them in kinetic terms. All right. So now we're going to go in and start talking about mechanisms of reactions. And the mechanism is one of the important things in terms of what affects the overall rate. How many steps does the reaction go in? Are there fast steps? Are there slow steps? How many slow steps? How many fast steps? How long does it really take for each thing to, uh, for, for the reaction as written to occur? And so it's, it's unlikely that reactions take place in one step. So that's uh, not, not too common. Usually they proceed through a series of steps. And each step is called an elementary reaction. So I've been mentioning elementary reactions, saying that for an elementary reaction, you can write a rate law without any data. You can just write it as is. So that's what you're doing in terms of mechanisms. You will see an overall reaction, and then you'll try to break it down into steps. And each step is an elementary reaction. So you can write a rate law for each step. And then think about whether that reaction uh, mechanism makes sense in terms of the data that's available for the overall reaction. 
So again, for the o an overall reaction, the order and the rate law cannot be derived from the stoichiometry. You wouldn't necessarily know if it's first order with respect to one thing, second order with respect to something else. So you can't do that. But for the elementary reaction, it occurs exactly as written. So that's you've broken it down when it's an elementary reaction or a step, you've broken it down so that it is occurring exactly as written. And then you can predict the rate law. So um, this, this is, uh, you're sort of breaking down the mechanism into the simplest steps. So let's look at, at an example uh, for this. So here is the decomposition of ozone. So you have uh, two molecules over here reacting to give you three molecules of oxygen. So a proposed mechanism then has two elementary reactions or two steps. And here in the first step, we have one molecule of ozone. Are there questions? It seems kind of noisy. Uh, one molecule of ozone going to O, uh, oxygen by itself there, plus O2. This uh, intermediate oxygen species then comes back and reacts with uh, ozone again to give two molecules of O2. So the first reaction is called unimolecular because there's only one thing reacting. What do you think the next one's called? Right, it's gonna be called bimolecular. Let's put that up there. Oh, I guess I should go back to this. All right, so molecularity is the number of reactant molecules that come together to form product. So that's molecularity. And the second one would be bimolecular. This is another one of those questions that can uh, turn up on the final that's supposed to be the easy points. So I ask what the molecularity is, and you look, there's one thing, it's uni, there are two things, it's, it's bimolecular. Uh, but people forget what that term means. So that's a good one to kind of keep in your back of the head. That's just a, uh, a really simple extra few points that you can get on a final uh, to recognize those, those terms. All right, so here are the, we're not going to get to four things reacting. We'll go only as much as three things reacting. So uh, unimolecular one reactant. An example of that would be some kind of decomposition or radioactive decay. Bimolecular, two things reacting. So here you would have two things coming together, colliding to form a product. And we'll talk uh, in the next few lectures about the energies associated with that reaction occurring. And then termolecular, I give you that that's a little bit of a harder one to uh, remember than the uni and bimolecular. But the termolecular are three things coming together to form products. So as one might imagine, uh, three things all coming together at the exact same time to form a product sort of in one step would be unlikely to happen. So these are fairly rare. So something that's written this way, if you see something that's written as a termolecular reaction, you may uh, predict right away that that's sort of unlikely to happen in one step. Um, any of you just trying to get a group of friends together to do something at the same time, knowing that getting uh, three people together at the exact same time to do something that you're planning to do uh, is rare that everyone's actually there at the same time to start. So you can remember that that's sort of a rare thing uh, to, to happen. But um, if three things did come together to react, that would be termolecular. All right, so now we can consider the rate laws for each step. And because these are elementary reactions or steps of the reactions, you can write the rate law exactly uh, from the reaction that's happening exactly as written. You can use the stoichiometry to consider the rate law. So let's look at the first one then. The rate is going to be equal to this K1 term. So the rate constant for step one, or K1, 
times the reactant, which is O3, the concentration of O3. So that's the rate law for the forward direction. In this case, there is no reverse direction to consider. So we only have this uh, rate law for the first step. In the second step, then, we have the rate equals K2. So that's the rate constant for the second step. And in some of your problems, you might not have these in the book. So you can always uh, have as a sort of, um, a, you can use K, you should use K1 for the first step. If there's a reverse uh, reaction, that should be K minus one. Uh, K2 for the second step. If there was a reverse reaction, it could be, would be K minus two, et cetera, et cetera. Again, these do not have reverse steps, so we don't have to worry about this yet. But you'll see more of these on, on Wednesday and on the problem set. So here the rate is K2 uh, times the concentration of O times the concentration of O3. So we can write those exactly as written because those are elementary steps, steps in an overall reaction mechanism. We couldn't write the rate law for this if it has multiple steps without experimental data to help us uh, do that. So then um, the individual steps should be able to be added together to get the reaction in question. And so here, if we add this together, we have two O3s and we have three O2s. And the O has uh, canceled out. So that is an intermediate in the reaction. So O here is a reaction intermediate. And the big trick in writing reaction mechanisms and figuring out rate laws for overall reactions up here is to cancel out intermediates. So you're going to spend the next few days getting ready for the, the problem set on Friday, getting rid of intermediates uh, in reactions. So it doesn't appear in the overall reaction equation, and it can't appear in any of your rate laws that define the particular reaction. So uh, just, just finally, this is the last slide, that reaction mechanisms are a series of steps. Reaction mechanisms can never be proven to be correct. They just can be consistent with data. So you're going to be predicting reactions that are consistent with the data on this next problem set. OK, thanks.